From success in the music industry as a television and film composer to touring the world and then literally dying on a stage, today's guest on my Best Life podcast sharing some of his key experiences with us is Donald Kwan. This is my Best Life podcast with Flavia Abadia. Today's episode is brought to you by Miski Organics. Use the discount code YourGirlFlav at checkout for 15% off your order. Hello and welcome to my Best Life podcast. I'm Flavia Abadia and today's guest is Donald Kwan. He's a musician, artist, he's scored for tons of movies and TV shows like Mutant X and Relic Hunter. He's a very prominent figure in the Canadian music industry and yeah, has had a great impact. So, welcome. Great, yeah, great to be here. <laughs> Thanks for for uh, interviewing me. I, I don't have that many chances to share my story. Mm -hmm. And I have a pretty uh, fun-filled story. Um, first of all, you know, I, I look a little younger than I actually am, so I have years of experience. I, I'm, I'm not ashamed to say I'm 54 years old, so okay. I have many years of experience even though I look younger yeah. um, I have a lot of experience um, so how did you get started like how well you know as a kid uh, I was always naturally inclined to doing music uh, I come from family of artists not musicians I'm the only musician in my entire family oh, wow. uh, but it's not that we're not creative. It's just I'm the only one that gravitated towards music. My brother and sister are both artists, um, like visual artists mm -hmm. and conceptual artists. Uh, I'm the only mus musical person. So when you're a little better at something when you're a kid, you tend to be, you know, singled out. Kids were singled out for being great baseball players or whatever I was singled out because I could play the piano um, and you know I'm not a genius but I was probably like three four years ahead throughout junior school ahead of anybody else like that's a long time you know when you're that young three years ahead is a long time that's like if you're six years old that's like double your mm -hmm. age so like that's a lot way ahead of everybody else right so I tended to gravitate towards music um, and ended up studying privately because I, wouldn't, I was too advanced for, for, for just taking lessons at school and stuff like that. So I studied privately. And the people that taught me became my mentors. I was an apprentice to people that saw kind of what I did and that I was kind of special in, in the music area. Uh, but I always want to say I'm not a genius. I'm not a prodigy. I'm not this like, oh my God, I can't believe all you. How do they do that? No. Yeah. I was always good at it and ahead, but I was, I was no genius and I'm still not. Um, I, I'm actually proud to say that because I don't get by by being, you know, I saw, I call smoking and burning guy. Like I, I will never sit down and play and your jaw drops. How is he doing that? Mm -hmm. I'm not that kind of guy. I'm a generalist. I try to do everything I do just a little better than everybody else. That's how I got through life. So I would, throughout school music, you know, always taught me that I, uh, because I was good at it, it, it became a social catalyst for me. Because I was good at it, I was always making friends and having that social interaction. Um, that's funny because as time went on, I get I, I get more of a loner and a geek about stuff where people become less important. And that was important for me for a span of 10 or 20 years. To be with people because playing it, music. It, well, I had to establish my practice. Like mm -hmm. all really good musicians end up having a 10 year period where they have no friends or anything. They're, they're practicing. Yeah. Right? So I kind of had to go through that while keeping a semblance of, of a social thing. And that was very important for me. I, I'm still basically a loner, and I was always a loner. I was very shy. 
I didn't have a ton of friends. So it was only I'm talking, you know, I was able to socialize with a couple people. So I ended up the end of high school with this kind of music, 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 music at the end of high school with some private teachers. One of them who saw me and, and, and you know, I was interested in science at one point. I was, you know, I wanted to be a, uh, the guy that, that invented artificial flavors for candy. <laughs> like, no word of a lie, I spent like three years of high school pursuing that career path. I wanted to be a chemical designer of flavors for artificial stuff. It's my geek, right? Coming out, that's what... So while I was doing music and doing all this, that's what I was focusing on. Right? I was thinking, oh, I'm going to um, do this for a living. And then uh, time, graduate high school, got to go to college. So my mentor said that, well, you know, I'm trying to be a film composer. Why don't you try that? You can make a lot of money. <laughs> so I said, sure. I'm like, I'll try it. If you think I'm... <laughs> I don't really know because you know at at uh, seventeen years old you have no like whatever You're like yeah. yeah do that so I said just yeah tried it. yeah if you yeah I'll go to college hey and my parents are gonna like it because I could go to college and I could do my music because there's this course at Berkeley College of Music for film scoring I said that's what my mentor does he says it's really good like you know you can score Hollywood films and you can it gets fun so so do that right all the dreams so I just went with it you know uh, worked it all out so I ended up going to Berkeley College of Music for five years problem is it's a great school but like most colleges you don't learn you learn very specific how to do things like facts and how to do the equations or whatever it is you, mm -hmm. but you don't actually learn what you are really going there to learn. I think that that applies to a lot of people that go to college. They go, okay, I'm taking this course, which I'm going to be a psychologist. Yeah. But they take psych and they take like all the things and they and then two years into it going, how is this going to make me a living or do any, how does it going to make mm. me happy? Like everybody goes through the same thing. So I did the same thing in college. You'd think that by identifying, hey, film scoring at Berkeley College, I'm going to feel, be a film scorer. But what I realized when I graduated, I looked at my, my final um, project and I said, this doesn't work. This picture, it looks dumb. It, 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 this is like awful. So I knew I didn't know how to write. To write to fit for film. film. Mm -hmm. Coming out of college. What I was supposed to have learned, I mean, college was fantastic, I'm not, I'm not saying that. I wouldn't trade it for the world. I had five of the best years of my life. But I didn't learn how to write film scores to make a living at school. So when I graduated, finally had that part of my life over, I said, okay, let's, let's try this film. Because I'm, my mentors, real mentors are for life. So these are mentors which were with me when I was 16 and will continue until the day I die, until the day they die. So you're still in touch with them? Oh, they're still my mentors. Oh, good. Uh, what happens with apprentices and mentors, and mm -hmm. everybody in that relationship will tell you, eventually the apprentices get start teaching the mentors because the mentors get old and the apprentices bring their new life experiences into it and they learn. Um, so one of my uh, mentors actually <laughs> um, called me up and said, um, can I hire you to be me because I can't do it. Like, it's not that I'm busy. So this was I'm, after college? Yeah. He offered you a, he said, an opportunity? He said, I don't know how to do hip hop and rap. He said, what is this new thing? Like, I have no, I have no idea. I said, well, you know, you have to do loops and samples and it's too repetitive and they go I have no idea what you're talking about can you do this for me because he got hired to do a score because of his reputation to do this kind of hip hop score mm -hmm. for one of the first kind of cool series like Wusun YTV was just starting oh, okay. and it's called okay. 
Okay. But it was supposed to have this kind of hip hop score, so all the characters were all these young, mm -hmm. young kids. And so my mentor said, "Can you help me with this? Like, I, I just need yeah. some help." Yeah. So I did the series, um, and my mentor had asked me to uh, help help them because he knew nothing about the the youthful music that was being done now. And I, I, I've gotten that response from a lot of my mentors. They've hired me to say, you know all about this stuff. Like, you know, can, can you help us on this, right? Uh, so um, it's great when the apprentice-mentor relationship turns out where the mentor is actually learning from the apprentice. So that's how you got your start. That's the circle, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the circle. Mm -hmm. Because um, how I got all of my work was a word of mouth for my mentors. My mentors wouldn't be able to do a project for whatever reason, and they would say, oh, this is, I have a, a young kid that can probably help you. He'll be cheap. Mm -hmm. I'm mentoring them, so I'll make sure I'm overseeing everything they do. So, like, go ahead, hire them. I, I, I fully support this, right? Um, and even to the day I was taking gigs from my mentors, they're still supporting me. They're still happy that their apprentice actually took their gig. And I did that several times. I, 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 I wasn't trying to take their gig. Mm -hmm. no, but you were hired. Like they, they recommended me mm -hmm. and they were hired, uh, hired me. And when I finished the gig, they said, I don't want to work with anybody else. So, which means that my mentors are now out of the game. <laughs> oh, no. But they're okay with that and have always been okay with that. Just like I'm okay with that to people I apprentice with. I mm -hmm. would be so happy if people who I mentored mm -hmm. became huge and had all the work. That I'd feel really proud, to be honest. So yeah. you started with that and your career went on for about 20 years or so? Um, well, the first... Uh, out of, out of uh, college, mm -hmm. the first 10 years was like a, any other musician. Wedding gigs, nickel and diming, you know, $20 gigs, trying to pay rent, trying to make a living. Yeah. Like it, you know, it was, it, 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 I, I spent 10 years until I, I got my first real film score. Everything changed after that. You know, because my mentors taught me how to keep track of stuff and how to get royalties and how to like they taught me so much about the business. Mm -hmm. Not by saying, "Hey, this is what you should do," but I would be working for them as a janitor, and I would see the sessions and I would go, "Oh, what's going on there?" And I'd learn and learn and learn and learn. So I learned from them, and they would just have me. They come, hey, I want to come to the session. I was getting paid amazing at the time, mm -hmm. um, but the re because they really actually needed the services I was offering. It wasn't just because oh you're my kid, you're you know I mm -hmm. need to give you some work. No, I was actually helping them a lot, and it was cheap for them. Like cost ratio was very good for them mm -hmm. for what I did because um, I'm the A type personality. I I get into it and I help. Like I really try to add to every single project I'm in. So, um, yeah, I lost track of what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, um, what were your biggest highlights throughout your career? Well, the, the first, uh, out of my entire career, there are two highlights. If I can nail down, like, you know, I, I've done hundreds and hundreds of, of gigs and there's been I could pull out any kind of experience and go, wow, this is great because of this. But there are two really important gigs. So you, there, were, there were really kind of very, very important gigs that shaped my career to what I am today. Uh, one was a film scoring gig. One was a performing gig. Uh, actually, there might, I can even say three, but I'll, I'll get to that. Um, 
the score the first real scoring gig I got uh, was kind I got it because of a mistake sometimes being out of it as a young kid and not knowing what you're doing work to your ben works to your benefit and I note that today I lose gigs to people because they're young and they have no idea what they're doing that's why they get the gig Okay. So that's why I got my first gig, Relic Hunter, uh, through a mistake. I basically sent the wrong cassette. At the time, we didn't have CDs. I was like, mm -hmm. we used cassettes. Cassettes were our medium, right? Cassettes. So I sent the cassette. I had uh, done my, uh, you know, learning from my mentors, I've done my due diligence to look up any submission that I'm going to submit to. I'll look up the, who the producer is, what are they doing, what have they done before, uh, what should I send, what should I... So I, the, this producer, my, um, my mentor recommended me to a producer. And I said, great, I'll submit. You know, you do this like three times a week, like it's constant, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm just another submission. So I do my thing. I, l I look at this was before the internet, so we couldn't Google stuff. So I had to, like, go to the library and watch TV and look at that, get my information that way, yeah. right? Like you couldn't just dial and Google, oh the name, oh that's why. No, you yeah. had to go out and spend a whole day trying to research. So I researched this producer that I was submitting to, and, and I said, oh this is great. They're doing this period piece. Um, uh, Everything they do seems to be a period piece, like Little House on the Prairie and stuff. Like mm -hmm. so, I was, so I'm going to put together a, 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 the best of my, you know, period piece music. So I put a cassette together and sent it off. And he got the cassette and he goes, uh, "No, I did. I like your music, but like, why, like." This let me first tell you the series I'm doing is a um, a cartoon version of Indiana Jones. I said that's about as opposite to a period piece as you can think. Um, and, and I said, oh, I'm really sorry, uh, but he said I like your music. I said, I said, well, well, well don't worry. I'll, tomorrow I'll send you my real demo. <laughs> So I cobbled together all this crazy stuff. At this point, I was just like, ah, oh, he wants it tomorrow. I don't care what. I, I just grabbed stuff, made a cassette. Yeah, the stuff you already had. And you said you made, like, fake commercials. There's fake commercials. There's mm -hmm. uh, bad, you know, rock and roll. There's mm -hmm. uh, me singing. There's me playing classical piano. Like, all just all yeah. crazy. All the stuff I did as a, since I was a kid. Yeah. Right? I, I borrowed... Um, rented synthesizers from Long McQuaid Music and okay. made my own little That's a music beats. store. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With uh, all my little beats and mm -hmm. I never showed it to anybody. I would hang out and just like make these tapes for myself. I still have them. Yeah. It's very funny listening to them. But um, so I just called together this you know half hour of stuff and I sent it to him and said well here. I, okay, I screwed up. I sent you this wrong tape. But here, here's a bunch of my other stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I don't hear from him for like, you know, days, maybe weeks. And I get a call from this producer in LA. He goes, this is blah, blah, blah from LA. And I say, yeah, uh, interesting, LA. It's like, you have a call from LA, but yeah, sure, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like, what do you want? <laughs> and he goes, uh, I got a tape from such uh, such such producer. Um, and I want to talk to you about it. <laughs> and then he proceeded to describe his new series that he had developed called Relic Hunter. Mm -hmm. And he said, succinctly, he just basically said, I got 50 tapes from composers in your area. We have to hire a Canadian because of the tax credits. I got 50 submissions from everybody in town. He said, I think you are the only person that can score my series. And I said, then I started taking him seriously. He said, the only person. Um, and he said, think about it. This is what it was. I'll send you a synopsis, blah, 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 blah. The whole 
rigmarole of doing that. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't talk to my, I went to my recording session to talk to other composers um, who had heard at that point that I got serious, right? They all call back, it's oh, so uh, do you want me, do you want me this? No, we're hiring Don Laquan. Mm -hmm. And they're all going, what the hell? Like, <laughs> he's the kid who just like, we don't even consider this guy uh, anybody. Because they were all 20 years older than you. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And they sent all their orchestral crazy stuff to them. Because the producer had also told me, he said, of the series, we need to know that you can deliver an orchestral score for this insane low amount of money. I said, yeah, yeah. I'd say yes to anything. You know, I said, yeah, no problem. Um, so word was out that I got the series, and then we started the process of actually doing the series, which was a, it's a, it's a whole story into itself. Um, we're talking about five different themes. We're talking about being one day away from being fired. Um, it all worked out in the end. Mm -hmm. I got the gig and was the only person that stayed on the series for all 66 episodes. I scored 66. No other person actually completed 66 episodes. No one. I'm the only person that went through all three seasons. So I uh, ended up um, getting the series, which to this day, now 20 years 25 years later where it's my best I've made the most money from it it's been my biggest mm -hmm. gig and almost everybody has heard of it and know, knows about it I used to watch it yeah <laughs> um, it's on again by the way on Bravo and in France it's oh okay because um, we tried very hard to make it timeless yeah the dress, the, there's nothing cool or hip about, like, oh, that dates it. Like, this was made in the 80s. So mm. many series are like that. You can go, this yeah. was made in the, what, what? Yeah, that was made in the 70s. It shows, you know, afros, yeah. but, like. So, <laughs> let's go back for a second. You said yes to doing an orchestral Score, but you had never done that before, and you're a kid saying yes just like that. Well, well, here, here's the funny thing. Well, a kid, you were 30 at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we were, we were at a time where nobody had figured out that computers can be used to create music. Now, 99.9% .9 of anybody making music uses a computer. Then, nobody did. Mm -hmm. If you said you may use the computer to make music, they people just roll their eyes and go, "Oh, well, you're some MIT geek that makes boop, 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 boop. like." <laughs> okay. That's what they think, right? Yeah. They have no idea. Because I had mentors, because mm -hmm. I had seen my mentors. Some of them were rich. They had bought two hundred thousand dollar synthesizers that could sample, blah blah blah. So, wow. I I had the knowledge. Of sampling when the world even producers had no idea that you could actually create an orchestral score with a computer and save paying 50 musicians imagine how much that cost 50 yeah. musicians union scale compared to putting an orchestra in your computer yeah you can't, even, no can't, you can't even match it in price, yeah, there's no and, Well, I was able, you know, make a long story short, I was able to basically do my score good enough so they, they couldn't even tell the difference between my sample score, which no one else was doing, by the way, at the time. I was the only guy trying to make scores mm -hmm. out of samples. So uh, when they asked for an orchestral score, this was a time when no, first of all, no one associated computers mm -hmm. with music. The concept of a sample was foreign to most people, even producers, even the highest level of Hollywood producer even. You know, they were a little bit ahead, but not much, you know, because Hollywood's all about old school. They're actually 10 years behind everybody else because of the unions and they have to have old guys 
keeping their jobs there even if they have no idea what's going on. Mm. That that's the way the world of the unionized filmmaking goes, right? You're not the hippest most recent thing if you're a part of that world. In Canada, we're kind of like rogues. We we do every, you know, we do we don't adhere to that. So they will say, hey, we need to do this cheap. We've got to hire this kid who doesn't have any experience, but we like this stuff, so we're going to hire him. They can do that in Canada. They would never do that in L.A. There's too many people lined up for work that have experience up the wazoo. Mm -hmm. That will, um, you know, that's the way it works there. So mm -hmm. here I got a chance to basically say to a producer, I can give you an orchestral score for very little money. Kind of explaining the process of putting samples into a computer and doing that, but not really, because they it was over their head. I couldn't have a conversation with them because yeah. it was technically over their head, literally. I tried to have a conversation about it, but it, it wasn't there. The understanding wasn't there. So I just said, I have a high-tech way because I'm young, I'm on computers, I have a high-tech way of putting a real orchestra into the computer and playing it back as if as if it were a real orchestra. He goes, oh, well, it's fine, Danny. You can explain it all you want, but prove it to me. Mm -hmm. Just send me a score. Just send, and, and you know, we're considering you for this gig. Um, typical of gigs, big gigs. One hand says you have it. The other hand says, oh, we're still considering you. Like, you have no idea what the politics are. Mm -hmm. So anyways, uh, my Canadian producer says, well, send me something just so I can tell everybody it, it's okay. I like you. I want to hire you, but you mm -hmm. got to prove to everybody. So just send me something. So I mocked together a thing on my, on my computers and my, my synthesizers and my low-end stuff and, and, and sent it to him. He heard it. He said, it sounds like an orchestra to me. He said, can you deliver this for a low amount of money? I said, yeah, of course. I knew I, it's a low money for, for them, but I was going to be making, making 10 times as much as I've ever made from any gig. So I'm, I'm happy as, like, you can believe. Mm -hmm. So I uh, did this quick demo, proved to the um, producer that I can do this. But you have to remember... I'm still kind of white lying to him about delivering an orchestra. Because you're doing it through samples. I know yeah. that it's not a real orchestra. But they can't even understand what I'm talking about. So, so who does it hurt? Right? If they think an orchestra, fake orchestra, sounds like an orchestra, which it, to them it does, exactly. Mm -hmm. I prove it to them. He said, this sounds great. You're, you're like, I want you. You're hired. This is amazing. You can deliver like this. I said, yeah, no problem. But just because I'm doing my due diligence, I didn't want to feel bad about possibly considering that I lied about it. Mm -hmm. So I took $20,000 of my own money and flew to Hungary to a real orchestra. And I created a sample library so that I wouldn't, for my own sake, yeah. my edification, my own edification. I went there and created my own sample library with the real orchestra. I took pictures, videos, mm -hmm. everybody saw me conducting. It's like, <laughs> like, like, like he, I yeah. wanted to prove to this producer that I wasn't just, you know, mm -hmm. making stuff up, that I was actually, I had a concept behind this. Remember, nobody has even heard that you can even mm -hmm. do music on computers, let alone samples. Like, they have no clue. So I'm trying to explain stuff for people that have, have never heard of this. This is all complete, utter fantasy to them. So I'm, he's just trusting me, and I'm proving it to him. And so you did it. I did. I sent pictures. I was, I was in Hungary. Mm -hmm. There was the real orchestra there. I only ended up making my sample iron there. I only paid for the orchestra once, not 66 times. Yeah. They got what they wanted. They got the orchestra in the sample version. But they didn't even understand the difference. 
I tried to have a conversation, but he, he, he was, it was over his head. He didn't care. He just said, I hear it. It sounds great to me. You're in. Mm-hmm. So I was, I was free and clear. I could just do, do whatever I want because I've met my mandate. Mm-hmm. It's an orchestra for all concerned. It's an orchestra because it is an orchestra. It's a sample. I sampled it. I went there. You found a smart or smarter way at the time, cheaper way. And it became to deliver. Me, it, what it turned out to be was I was three years ahead of everybody else. So I basically cleaned up for about five years. I got every single gig in Toronto. They were so happy that I was the only person. The Relic Hunter went three seasons. I was the only person out of everybody, producers included, that actually worked on all three seasons. Oh, wow. I was asked back by every new conglomerate that produced the show. Three separate ones. I was always nailed as the only creative that... That that wrote for all three seasons. Nice. I'm still known for it. You can look me up on IMDb. You'll mm-hmm. see. The writers are all different. The producers are different. The directors are different. Everybody's different season to season. The actors are even different. Only the lead. Yeah. Uh, for two leads are went all three seasons. Literally, the rest of the production changed. But I was so proud. I thought for sure I was going to meet with this new producer on the third season. And say. It was great to get two. There's no way he's going to yeah. um, ask me back. No one else gets asked back. And he just simply goes, no one else. He said, you're the only one that's nailed this series. What you do is exactly what we need. And looking back, it is what they needed. This isn't a $20 million, well, $50 million Indiana Jones movie. Yeah. Uh, which they were envisioning in their head. This is a TV series, local TV series, a budget of like a million dollars per episode. That's very low for the, what they're trying to do. They're trying to make it look like Indiana Jones and convince people that it's just as good. Mm-hmm. For a budget, like a fifth of what they... So these producers, they're all brilliant, right, in Toronto, who figured out how to make Lake Ontario look like Greece, blah, blah, blah. Like they... It's amazing what they did with the series. They didn't uh, travel anywhere for it? It was all shot on Lake Ontario. Oh, really? They, they did Greece. They did it at the Amazon. It was all done in the park. What? I used to watch that show. It was all... It, none of it was location. None of it. They, okay. they had to do a bit of location, yeah. but it wasn't in an exotic place. It, they did a bunch in Paris because they had the partnership with, with France. So, okay. so they made the Amazon in pa- on the Paris seating, shooting stage. But that's why they thought I nailed it. Yeah. Because I actually did my homework mm-hmm. and I took the footage they gave me and I put up John Williams' score to it. Just to see, okay, this is what they want. Mm-hmm. I did it. It was awful. You take something that's not as good on all levels as the original Steven Spielberg thing, mm-hmm. and, and you put the music that was like very expensive orchestral to that, it makes it look really bad. So even if I gave them real orchestra, I would have lost the gig because it wouldn't have worked. Yeah. The reason why my music worked is because the samples are, are a, a tenth the music of of a real orchestra Mm -hmm. and because that music was put with the picture it matched it 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 totally made sense the producers never saw their show with real orchestra from john williams because if they did they they would just fire the whole thing and get rid of the concept they would say to themselves we can't do this but I proved that because of the way I kind of did it is that my version of an orchestral score was actually the exact match for the pictures that were there. Because it looks like the Amazon, but it's not really the Amazon. You know, the cameras aren't the fancy Hollywood cameras. They're like, so 
it matched. Mm -hmm. And that's why I stayed for three seasons, because that's why they said I nailed it. Good, yeah. And no one else would have been able to nail it, because they would have used a real orchestra, they would spend all this money, they would have made no money, because of the budget was so, so low. And it would have, they would have been fired, because a real orchestra doesn't work with this series. You can do it now. You can take the sound off, watch the show, and put John Williams next to it, and you go, that's really bad. But you watch the show now with my music, and you go, well, this is a fun thing. You, yeah, music makes such a difference. It doesn't in occur like to the you. The mood and the, how you think of it, yeah. It, it, it's so important. So, so you asked what was you know, one of my biggest achievements. Yeah. That whole process of landing that gig and keeping that gig, nothing will be that for me. And, it, and that concept of working with producers is what has mm -hmm. carried me for 20 years. I stayed in that mindset because of what mm -hmm. I learned from my mentors. I stayed in that mindset and it's the way I work now. So the way it ends up is that I'm not the busiest composer, but when I'm right, I'm, when I'm the right guy, it's really good. They can't, people cannot imagine something else. I nail it. So I'm proud of that because I'd rather nail one in 10 mm -hmm. than to schmooze 10 projects. Yeah. I'm known for one thing and I don't get a lot of gigs when it's right. So this, so this is the proof. This is the proof of why I like working this way. Nine out of ten composers, when they do a, a score for someone, they have to go through a process called approval, which means the producer has to see what you've done before they will sign off on it. Uh, that's the bane of a lot of composers' existence because they have to kind of mock up and prove to the producer that they're on the right track. Mm -hmm. They're not trusted 100%. I've never had a gig where I've had to even approve once. I've done hundreds of movies and TV series and I don't have to approve music, which means when they hire me, they know they're gonna get what they get and they don't have they don't make me prove it. Well let me hear what you're gonna do with this. No, they don't do that. The series I'm working on now, mm -hmm. um, I'll even call them and say, well, what would you like on this? What you know, let's let's talk. They say, mm -hmm. we trust you hundred percent. It's up to you. Just do it and we'll love. It. Wow. That's not just That's... this series, that's my whole career. Yeah. So I don't work. That's why I've never done many jingles because I'm just not into the the game. Mm -hmm. Like play us this. We're gonna do. Like just just get down to it. You hire the right person. I will work my ass off mm -hmm. to give you everything. But you trust me. You get an amazing score. If you try to control me and try to oh. Uh, and prove that this is what yeah, like, don't make me run around like, and so I'm not one of the busier composers but when I get a gig they want me and they want what I do and I don't have to approve anything so that's the end kind of anything I'm, I'm proud of mm -hmm. I can tell you that's what I'm proud of I'm proud that when people hire me they trust me and they don't have to make, they don't make me prove this or that, that I'm on the right track. Like a couple times, like, uh, they'll, they'll say, um, this, you didn't get this one right, once in a while. And it's because for a good reason. It's because there are two ways you could see this. You could see this as a love story or you could see this as a uh, angst story and it one's not right or wrong you could it depends on what do you want mm -hmm. so there are times I've had to readdress an episode because my take on it wasn't the take of them but 
again, it's done with with no like, oh, we, we think you might be losing it on this. We don't, we don't you're not mm-hmm. getting what we want. No, they trust me and say, oh, you got this kind of one kind of wrong. Uh, just this is what we really want, and you know, see at the mix. That that's my career, and 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 that's the thing that people don't realize is the best thing of my career is the fact that people leave me alone. When they hire me, they want me. They know they want me, and they let me do what I do. And I don't know if there's many people working in this town that can say that. Yeah. Cause I have a lot of friends, and I know what they go through. Um, some have written scores three, four times before they they got an approval on it. So I, I I screwed all that. I don't I don't have that issue. It doesn't happen to me. So I'm very lucky for that. I feel lucky, but that's also what I've tried to do. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm okay with not getting every gig. I'm okay with getting the ones where they know I'm the one. I'm okay with that. So you got every single gig for about five years. Well, not every single well. gig, but I cleaned up. Let's just say okay. I got, it was very common for me to get a gig. Okay. Yeah. And you said your <laughs> other highlight was a performance gig. The other highlight of my career has nothing to do with my film score career. Like, nothing. Okay. There is a connection eventually, mm-hmm. which I'll tell you about, which... It's kind of unbelievable, but mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but the other gig that was very important to me is a gig I, I got with Lorena McKenna, okay. the Celtic singer. Um, getting that gig was very very simple. It was it was simply someone heard uh, someone on their team heard about me and said come for an audition I went for audition passed with flying colors end of story I was on tour five days later on a, on a worldwide tour um, I stayed with Lorena for 10 years oh wow so I did so you ev- were doing you were with her for 10 years while you were scoring yes. all this stuff yes okay yes um because I figured how to score on computer, like just take my computer with me and mm-hmm. I can do it. And I was good at politics, so people who, who are highfalutin love it when you say, oh yeah, I'll be back in two days, I'm just flying in from South Africa or something. Like, they, they like that. Yeah. Like this is what I do every, every week, right? So like, mm-hmm. the, so okay, okay, that's, you, you, you know, we'll, we'll give you concession, that's fine. So I was able, while working with Lorena, I was able to be scoring constantly um, while I was working with Lorena. Mm-hmm. Um, and Lorena L- L- wasn't a f- like every single day. Like it, it'd be chunks of three months and then it'd be six months off and then a chunk for a couple months and then a year off. And like, it was like that. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't literally trying to score at, while I was sitting in the studio with Lorena, like scoring, yeah, like I no. would, it, you, it was, it, it was, it was during the year I would be able to do cut it back and forth. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they crossed, and, and it, it mm-hmm. was like crazy. But that's a life of, of a of a you know, high level musician, mm-hmm. you know, um, knowing when you know you're, whether you should take the Concord because you got to get back you know, like five hours earlier from London. Like mm-hmm. that's kind of life I, li- I lived. Um, but the reason why that gig was so important, travel. She's the reason why I got to see most of the world, well, a lot of the world, without having to do it myself. Mm-hmm. I would just be part of her project, and every few days they I get a call, you, we're going to uh, Europe, or we're going to Australia, you know, pack up your stuff, and 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 the gig was great because we play in front of three thousand, three five thousand people, and she was so professional that everything was taken care of. Crew roadies, I had my own personal roadie that 
set up my gear an hour before it was needed. I would show up just myself. Everything would be set up. Oh, amazing. Turned on, loaded, worked out. It was any issue. It wasn't my problem. I showed up and I played for two hours. Everything done for me. And that was, that was, gig was over. I go and do whatever I That's want nice. until the next day. And you got to travel, you got to sightsee. And... I saw everything. I made friends. We all did. Mm -hmm. The camaraderie within the group was a huge group. It was 14 musicians. Oh, wow. And 20 crew. When we were traveling on land, we had three full-time buses and two trucks in our entourage which drove across Australia, Europe, North America, like from Toronto mm -hmm. to California, mm -hmm. and every city in between. We would do these gigs over 10 years. We, we'd cover everything. You know, the, oh, the, the West Coast gig, East Coast gig. Uh, it's just, it's I got to travel. And, and, and Lorena was so wonderful providing the amenities for us. She wanted to treat the musicians like gold. She was very demanding, but she provided the highest level of touring experience you can imagine. We were put up minimum five-star hotels. Every gig in every city we were in. Wow. It was so embarrassing because it was great. Hey, I'm not complaining about being put up in like five star hotels in mm -hmm. Vienna, Austria. Like, I'm yeah. not complaining. But when it cost me $50 to get a glass of orange juice, oh. <laughs> it kind of eats into your, into your income. <laughs> That's yeah. the only downside of having that high level. The costs are like, you, you are in the world of the rich at that point, mm. where no one thinks about anything about dropping a thousand bucks on dinner. Like, it, so you're in a different world. Yeah. So that was hard for us. For us, we we're, were always musicians. We never really became part of that, but we were- At least you got to experience we, it. And yeah. we were being treated like that. Mm -hmm. Like, it was nice to experience that. Like, thank goodness that was, the Facebook wasn't around there because I would have been posting and people would be like, <laughs> oh my god! What is this? What like I'd be in this palatial, like, uh, hotel, mm -hmm. like highest like six star hotel in in uh, in Rome, mm -hmm. and it would be all like. I, I, a few times I would just sit there going, "This is ridiculous." <laughs> I'm sitting there, but I have to. I'm gonna be able to spend two hours here, and we're. I'm being treated like like a king, like. So, time's up by ten years, mm -hmm. and I thank her so much for giving me that life experience. Um, the world isn't the same way anymore in terms of the music industry. Yeah. There's no way anybody, even if you're Taylor Swift, you're gonna give five star hotels to every single one of your crew. Like, not gonna happen these days. It's just not. So. I'm really happy she did what she did. Mm -hmm. She did invest a lot into making me who I am. And I appreciate that and always thank her for that. Um, because like, it just wasn't like one gig, it was 10 years where I got to know what it's like to do things right and to do things at a very, very high level. Mm -hmm. you know? And um, yeah, so so that had nothing to do with my film scoring, like yeah, zero. That, that's really cool. But it's a it's a big chunk of my life, which it makes me who I am as a musician today. And I want to talk about something else that would like has made you who you are today. You were working super hard for so long, doing all these gigs, and then. One day when you were on stage, it just collapsed. Well, you know, I've always been a person to never say no to a project. Mm -hmm. I'm more 
I take it as being, okay, this is a challenge. I'm going to do this. It doesn't seem to be possible. I know a lot of people, bless them, who are very sm who are much smarter than I am. And if things were too much, they would just say no to it. Yeah, that's an important lesson in life. To I, I couldn't do that. Yeah. I could not say no to a gig. I could not. I would just figure out a way of doing it. Even if it meant hiring someone and letting them do the whole gig myself. I, I still wanted to be in control. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would just never say no. And because I love playing, I love music, I love all the experiences, I would just do it all myself. Ended up, you know, 2009, I was touring with Lorena. Back and forth on planes doing that whole high-end Lorena mm -hmm. gig. I was scoring um, a t two TV series at the same time. Wow, okay. Juggling it, um, writing at night, doing the Lorena gig, but instead of going out and seeing the town, I'd go back and, and, and write my scores. Um, we, we, internet was just starting. So I was able to to work across the seas with my people here. I had like five employees at the time, okay. which is insane. I wouldn't have that like I, not even near that. Uh, but at the time, I had I had five people working mm -hmm. for me. They were all composers. They were all like, there was a guy named Hans Zimmer. I was mm -hmm. kind of like the Canadian Hans Zimmer for a very short period of time, mm -hmm. and uh, so I was doing all this stuff, touring. I was in a third, two other bands at, this, at the time. That's so insane. One was another big band called Lighthouse. Okay. They are a famous Canadian band from the 60s, like probably the, the fam most famous Canadian band in, in the 60s. So I was touring with them. I was also playing with a group called the Derek Miller Band, who's a, a First Nations rock and roll blues outfit, a quartet, and we would just mm -hmm. like be crazy on it. like we were just like turn our amps to 10 and play <laughs> like that's people fun. loved it like it was just but that's loud. three bands and two, two TV se shows all at the same time that's insane and I was doing it I wasn't screwing up anything I was there for everybody the toll it took was on me so I, I'm playing you know I just come back from Edmonton playing with Lorena I had this gig with Derek Miller in Kitchener. Went nuts. It was great, great release. So, and in the, in the middle of the concert, in front of like a thousand people, I dropped dead. Like not fig not figuratively, literally, I dropped. I had a, what they call a, a fatal heart arrhythmia, which means that uh, a, a, uh, people have that when they're doing marathons. Like they they'll be totally fit and eighteen years old they're doing a marathon and they drop dead in the middle of it. It's happened a lot. It's what happens when you, I mean, it's a very complicated thing. It's a, your heart beats like, you know, 20 billion times in your lifetime or whatever. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I don't okay. know, but it, it, it's very, so you push your body, keep pushing it, pushing it, and I just kept pushing it. I had no, no um, uh, filter. I just kept pushing. At some point, your body is going to give out. You can't go forever. So at that time, I, was, I stayed for three nights in a row. I hadn't slept. Um, thank God I wasn't on any substance of any kind. I don't even drink. Yeah, that's good. Cause if, this was just natural. Yeah. This was my natural adrenaline. Up for three days, doing all these gigs, because who wouldn't? Like I'm playing to Lorena in front of 3,000 people in the middle of Rome. They get asked to do the Edmonton Folk Festival, which, like, there's 10,000 people, and you're the star of the whole entire festival. Mm -hmm. Like, your group is the star. So then you don't what say happened no. after? Like, how? Because you're here. My, <laughs> my whole world changed. Because yeah. I died. I was put into a coma. I was... Um, just by luck. A lot of luck happened to me that day. Well, um, yeah. Five lucky things happened all at the same time. It'd be literally like the equivalent of winning 
the major lottery five times in a row in the same week. That's what happened to me. All these things came together to make me come alive again. When I went down, there wasn't the proper EMS, mm -hmm. so they didn't get to me very quickly. Um, I can talk about this now because there are no more lawsuits involved. Yeah. At one point there was lawsuits, so I couldn't talk about yeah, yeah. anything to anybody. Um, uh, now I won't talk about the results of anything. Um, no, yeah. But what I can say is that one day I just decided life is too short to be worrying about lawsuits for 10, 20 years. So I made a choice to just not even go there. I just stopped everything. It just said, don't, don't bug me with this. I have my life to live. So I'm going to reinvent myself. And that's what I did. The, the, the hospital I was brought to an emergency, mm -hmm. eventually, eventually the ambulance came, mm -hmm. brought me to the nearest hospital. Happens to be one of the best research hospitals for stroke in the world. Oh, good. Okay. In Kitchener, Ontario, it's called St. Mary's Hospital, research hospital. They had all the forward stuff. So they said, this guy's dead. We can try to bring him. They got me going again, mm -hmm. right? So I died, they got me going, and said that there's no way he's recovering from this. He's basically, tell everybody, it's, he's, he's, at best he's gonna be a vegetable. And that's what the word was going out to the whole community, was that I died. And technically I did die, but because I was brought to this hospital, they immediately gave me propofol. That's the drug Michael Jackson died of. Like, oh. It's really strong. They gave me propofol as part of the therapy to basically keep me alive at the very lowest level. Okay. To allow my brain to heal from a stroke that most people would not recover from. I'd be mentally deranged and brain damaged. Usually that is the prognosis of someone going through what I did. 17 minutes of no oxygen to the brain. 17 minutes. Oh my God, that's... So yeah. they, they cooled my, super cooled my brain. If it, it oh, wow. Almost froze it, put me into a coma. And my friends and family came and saw me for a couple of weeks looking at me saying, this guy's not going to make it. Like, how's this guy going to make it? The guy's in a coma. He died. They brought him back and they got him like this far. That's about it. Pe they say people that have had this, they said, you know, you're, you're not going to see the, the guy again. Like, he's, he's basically, he's alive. We've kept him alive, but he's dead. Like, he's not going to recover very well. Of course, they're always, they, doctors and hospitals know not to get your hopes up. They, they'll tell you yeah. the worse than the better. I, well, I right? feel like that's also to cover themselves. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, but it was hard for my friend's family because they basically all thought I was a goner. So, how long were you in the hospital for? I don't know. Uh, I'm still getting facts. Um, I know my perception. I think I was three weeks in the whole process of putting in a coma and then eventually coming out of it. I think it was a probably three, it might be shorter, it might be mm -hmm. longer, I have no idea. And no one has told me because it doesn't really matter at this point. Yeah. But that's my perception of it. My perception is skewed because I literally half my brain retained its its neurons but half my brain lost everything so I couldn't really play I basically had whole chunks out of my brain function so I could sit down and play a bar of a Chopin piece like perfectly mm -hmm. and then I would have no idea like how I did that 
and 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 how it related to this like it's a chunk missing so i have all these chunks scattered in my brain which are there like i'll remember one person yeah it's like i i i, I, I yeah i saw yesterday even though i haven't seen in 30 years and then another person i have no clue who they are like they're my best friend and i'll look at them though like who are you i have these chunks removed so i've over the past seven years i've had to and I'm still doing it in the midst of doing that. I have to fill in these these chunks that disappeared out of my brain. And how have you recovered? And how has your mindset changed with everything? Well, oh, <clears throat> when you come out of a coma, like I did, m many people envision it as like Dorothy in Wiz Wizard of Oz. Oh, like you're just when she comes <laughs> when she comes out, like, yeah. what happened to me? Where am I? What? That's the Dorothy, right? Mm -hmm. No, the reality is that when you come out of a coma, you're like a baby. Yeah, a baby knows nothing. They, but they know everything about their life. They don't need to know anymore. They don't need to be worrying about what's happening tomorrow. They're a baby. They, they, they're out of it. They, that's all they, it's like, I'm hungry. Like, I'll cry. That's me. Mm -hmm. That was me. So I started as a baby and had to use my brain to fill in all the missing parts. Like, I lost the ability to conceptualize what time was. So I had no idea. I was very frustrated because I couldn't interpret the idea of one minute, one hour, one second, the past, the present, it was all, to me, it was just all life. Like, I wasn't hurting. That's all I cared about. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you mean last? What are you talking about? What's, what's last week? What, what is that? Like, what's last week? What do you mean I have, I'm supposed to have lunch at one? What does that mean? I have to wait till that stupid thing goes around like that twice, and then I'm going to eat? Like, I'm hungry now. Yeah. Like, it was... The people I had to deal with, my the nurses, they're all, all, they're used to it. Mm -hmm. But like people, like I have friends like that were at my side that came on, and that they were like, they didn't know how to deal with it. It's like imagine like talking to yeah. someone who's at that out of it. Like I'm not screwing around. Like I, I have no idea. Like I'm confused. Like were you here yesterday? And like what's yesterday? Like are you coming yeah. tomorrow? It, it, is that the same as yesterday? Like, this was the conversations, and I would play, and they go, hey, you're back, and then they're going, I have no idea what I did, just did. Like, did I play something? Like, what was that? Yeah, I could go, blah, 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 blah. they go, yeah, that's great. I, they said, you know, well, let's jam. You know, I'll play this chord, and I say, I can't play, like, I have no idea what you did. Like, <laughs> you're, you're, you're freaking me out, like, so you had to slowly learn everything. <laughs> it's been seven and years, like seven years, and I'm still going through it. But you're working on more stuff now. You're scoring a TV series. Funnily, a TV series started 15 years ago. And they're so they're so dedicated. Those producers, they just will not stop. We're now working on on, on 66 episodes of an hour long dramatic series like that's that's nothing to sneeze that that's really difficult to do a full on this is not a web series this is a series a tv series and it started 15 years ago and has gone through incarnations over 15 years and i'm working on it at this moment they've got another funding of money over 15 years and they're just repackaging it into a crazy new thing and it's a vital thing that's happening right now yet it was started 50 years ago you know when I was just in the middle of like trying to become a composer uh, I think this came at the exact same time as well oh happened. wow so I was juggling yeah. both things at the same time and by the way relic hunter I think I, as I mentioned, I almost lost. Mm -hmm. I, I was literally eight hours away from being booted 
hundred percent. You're God. We're going with someone else because you can't deliver. <laughs> like through all that, getting the gig you with the orchestral blah 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 blah. Go through all that. It came down to the theme, where they they weren't oh, the theme happy. Song. They weren't happy with any. I had done ten themes for them, and they said, "Yep." I hate to say this, I've had a meeting with all the worldwide producers. We need something by tomorrow morning or else. Sorry, like, you know, you've been great so far with this orchestral stuff and like, it sounds great, but you haven't nailed the theme and I'm sorry. Um, we're gonna have to let you go tomorrow morning. If you don't, if we don't, uh, he said, you know, you have a chance, you have tonight, but that's it. And, um, you're probably not going to be able to come up with something because you've tried 10 times. But you did. I did because of my mentor. I accredit them 100% for me getting that gig back and not losing. I've already spent $20,000 of my own money into getting the gig. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm still in a, this was my first big gig. Like, yeah. I'm making like minimum wage up until this point. Yeah. This is like my first gig and I'm one night away from losing it. Right? So I called my mentor and I said, what do we do? They said, well, we'll help you and, and you have to just trust us. And they told me a musical trick. Mm -hmm. They just said, write a theme. Like they heard the theme mm -hmm. and they said, they said, it's way too close to Indiana Jones, but which is what they were, they've been pushing on me for Aww. three months. Indiana Jones, you want the sound of Indiana Jones, you want the same thing, you want John Williams, you want to, that's like, <laughs> and I, I, I play it to my mentor, like this is what, I just about to be fired, I played my mentor. My mentor goes, it sounds way too like Indiana Jones. And that's when I realized that having that kind of music on a cartoon series sounds wrong. It's you say just cartoon wrong. series, but it's not literally a cartoon. It's yeah. It, it it's, was meant to be a car. It was oh really? A, yeah. It, the way the it was designed is that it's a live action version mm -hmm. of a cartoon. Oh. That oh. that was their concept. Oh. So it it should have been an animated series, but they decided oh. to make it with real people. Okay. That's why it is like it is. Oh. That's why real orchestral music would not work with it. So it, then you changed. So yeah. I talked to my mentor. My mentor said, um, "This is what you've done is way too close to John Williams." It's a no wonder it's not working because that John Williams wouldn't work with this. They say there's one trick uh, that's always worked for us. Mm -hmm. Just do that. I can't tell you what it is, but yeah. It, there's one trick. So you did the trick. It, it's simple. It, it's literally use these notes. And then? In a different order. Use these notes. Because every time we use these notes, it, it gets us the gig. Like he literally said that. He could have been lying. Who knows? But it doesn't matter. I did what he said. And the producer listened to it. And I did a demo. Mm -hmm. The producer listened to it and said, you squeezed by this. We have a big showing of this tomorrow with all the worldwide producers like ten of them in the same room watching it on a big screen he says he says, I'm very proud of you um, you nailed it he goes phew tomorrow's our big showing right he goes I'm putting it up with our picture tomorrow in front of ten investors and producers Wow. I went the next day they cranked it up, they played it with my new theme, got a standing ovation, and they clapped. Wow. Yeah. I was that close. That's, a, yeah. I was that close. Where uh, there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> and another little snippet to that is that this is why you shouldn't be pick heavy with stuff. Mm -hmm. So once I got the theme, like this was all the same night, right? Mm -hmm. Like it was like hours, just hours, just right after each other, right? So I gave him the theme that he said, oh, you nailed it, you got it, this is great. He said, let's make it even better. He said, 
the producer goes, my assistant's a, a musician, composer. Why don't you, he has some good ideas. Why don't you just like, yeah. He, he's work good. With work yeah. with him. Work with him. Work with him. He's his, his assistant, right? So, <laughs> my theme, which has now been approved by the produ executive producer, right? Mm -hmm. Now I have to, now he's making me work with his assistant, who's a part time composer, right? I'm rolling my eyes, going, oh, fuck. So, I, so he goes, yeah, you should modulate. Yeah, you should modulate in the middle. And I'm going, Okay, whatever I'll do it because you know, he That's says good. you were open minded my, my producer my the producer who just said that I I dodged a bullet mm -hmm. <laughs> said talk to we'll make it even better yeah talk to my assistant my assistant like to me I'm it's just so random after going through all these revisions yeah. it's just so random. hey you should modulate like well, that's good. what is that gonna do modulate it's stupid right so I did it. So for people who don't know music, can you explain what modulate is? It takes the same melody and puts mm -hmm. it higher. Yeah. But it's the same melody. It just raises the mm -hmm. pitch into a higher place. I did it after just like rolling my eyes and I said, yep, it's way better. <laughs> Good. And so I produced it like it was six o'clock in the morning. I produced the hell out of the demo of it with the modulation and all the stuff. He also suggested another thing, which I rolled my eyes at. Again, it's during this one night, right? Mm -hmm. After I modulated it, he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, it's way better. And I agreed at that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was right way better. He said, he has one more idea. I said, no. No, he said, it'll make it better. He said, it's not hard hitting enough. He, he wasn't using the right words, but he goes, my assistant has an idea. I said, I said okay, okay, what is it? He goes, it needs a backbeat. So just add chick to the whole thing I said oh, I've been at this point I've been orchestrating and doing all these little things like you're gonna tell me to put a boom chick boom chick over all my great work of orchestral writing yeah. he goes just put boom chick and turn it up I go unlike the modulation mm -hmm. I wasn't so impressed I said man now it sounds like a pedantic like ding, look, that it's it's like it's not even that groove it's not even a, it's mm -hmm. a just put boom tap boom chop the whole thing so I did it now I like it now it was the right call now years later yeah mm -hmm. I can say it's not as good musically mm -hmm. but for the purpose of TV theme it works it's perfect you cannot mess with that. That is a theme now. I'm so proud that I've been able to develop a theme that is world known. It's not the most famous. It's not mm. like Star Trek, but people know it. People call me to do arrangements of it for marching man, for like, like it, it, oh, it, it's, cool. it's in the public, yeah. worldwide public eye, which no other Canadian composer has achieved. Unless they moved to LA and became a big LA composer, which a couple of people did, mm -hmm. but that's that's my pr I'm proud mm -hmm. because of that. And the version with the boom chick is is the version. Yeah. With the modulation and the boom chick, it's way better than I could have done. So I'm very thankful to this assistant of the producer, whose musical ideas were actually very, very good. And because you were willing enough to like do it. set your ego aside, I had to because <laughs> and I was li he literally is the same guy who basically told me I've lost the gig unless I give him something by the morning, mm -hmm. and I did, and I work with his assistant to mm -hmm. make it even better. Afterwards, and yeah. I got a standing ovation. Mm -hmm. 
Like they were screaming, they were yelling, hooping, oh, yeah, yeah, we got it, we got it. These are the people that have invested probably yeah. two hundred million dollars in this thing. Ooh. As a as a collective of ten people. Yeah, well they have to be happy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But my producer was so sure that they were all gonna love it because of all the things that we did that night. And okay. that I, so the assistant helped that night as well? Yeah, it was all that okay. one night. It was literally from wow. the time okay. he called me. He, it was like probably 6 so o'clock. So mentors and the assistant. So it all the lesson came to is to also work with other people. <laughs> oh, yeah. my goodness. What a, it, <laughs> so you've had this amazing career. You've done all this stuff. Is there any advice you'd like to share with people in general and also musicians because you've been you've had lots of success and more so you've been on the road to recovery from like a stroke which is amazing the the biggest thing is that the most important thing to me now is the fact I I can start again so I can look at my past life and say I like this I don't like this I'm not gonna do this I'm not gonna do this I'm gonna do this and I can rebuild a new life that's the upside the downside is that I can't do half the things I used to be able to do I'm not capable of it anymore because the stroke affects you that way I'm very lucky to come out of it as coherent as I I am mm -hmm. I'm very lucky and thank goodness the luck was on my side when they brought me to St. Mary's Hospital and they were able to give me the procedures that they didn't know was going to work, but they knew what they were doing. So whatever they did with me, I came out of the coma and was able to recover. So many people have a stroke, they are out of it, and they never recover. They never recover. They don't get better. They may not get worse, but they don't yeah. recover. So you're here for a reason some very important reason I'm here and what I want to share to the world is you know I can't define what I'm here for but there's some basic things which are clear I'm here to interface with other people to help other people to be part of other people's lives and to not be selfish money has gone from the most important thing in my life the least important like literally so much so sometimes I find myself with no money after having a stroke seven years pass with virtually no work your savings are depleted so I had to start again and I'm doing it now and the beauty of it is that whether I'm poor or whether I'm rich money-wise, life is great right now. I wouldn't trade my life for anything right now. It's fantastic. I love everything I'm doing. I love everything that happens. Sometimes I really am poor. Mm -hmm. But I know a lot of people that are poor. And we just make do. We figure it out. I used to be, I used to care a lot about money, so I made a lot of money. When you care about it, you make a lot. But the cost of doing that, I, I don't accept. I won't do it. I could say, okay, I just want to make money now. But I won't do it. I just can't do it. Even if I have no money, where I really should be, you know, I have a family and stuff like that, but we're all, everything's good. You know, it, it all works out. It's very difficult, but it all works out. And I realize that to have a good life, you don't need all that money. In fact, sometimes it holds you back because it, 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 it makes you uh, think about things which are irrelevant in life, not important at all. Right now, I know 100% of my focus is only on things that are important to me, to my family, to you, to people I interface with. We have amazing interactions, which I wouldn't have when I was focused on making money. Mm -hmm. The first thing I'd, I'd say, meeting you in my old self was like, okay, what kind of business are we gonna do? Like, how am I gonna, how are you gonna pay me? How am I gonna pay you? How are, how are we gonna work together to make some money? 
and that's not even even in my thoughts at all now. That mm-hmm. would be the driving force of whether I came, of whether I talk to you again mm-hmm. <laughs> in my old self. If I couldn't see a way of making money, I would say, I don't have time to talk to you right now. It's very different. And there are a lot of people, you can see in their behavior, there are a lot of people that haven't crossed that. They're still all about money. And, and there's nothing wrong with making money. No, and they're nice people, and they can, mm-hmm. you know, but this is why I've learned for personal reasons. There are far mm-hmm. more important things than making money. Oh, for sure, yeah. And I have to be careful not to say that flippantly. Yeah. Because people will look around and say, well, this is not someone that had no money. Mm-hmm. But to be honest, it is. If you visualize something, things happen. And you either make the money you need, or you get the stuff without needing the money. By interfacing with other people and trading, yeah, trading experiences experiences. And you know, money's never gonna go away and it's what runs the world. So that's fine. Rent still has to be paid, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But there's a difference between doing all those things with the mindset of I'm doing this because I want to make, I want to be rich. Or I'm doing this because I care about what we're doing right now. There's a huge difference between that mindset, even though you might not see a difference in in the room. Mm -hmm. But that's why I really appreciate this kind of interview because I can verbalize stuff that I don't verbalize to anybody. You've given me a chance to listen to myself talk and go, actually, I don't like that. <laughs> I'm going to change. Or, hey, that's great. I think I'm going to yeah. embrace that. Like, I get to hear myself, and that's important. You know, because when you're making money and you're trying to make money, you, you tend not to listen to anybody except unless they have some plan to make you more money. Mm-hmm. You discount everybody that's not going to make you money. If you think, you, you probably know a lot of people like that. If you're not yeah. going to eventually somehow become famous or make money or something, then really, I don't have time for it. I meet new artists all the time like that. Is that you know that they're so driven to becoming rich and famous that they don't really care about, hey, do you want to hang and talk about life? No. I have I have this thing because it's it's, it's a balance because <laughs> like well I I don't make music for like fame and money because I feel like you can make money in other places much yeah, more easily exactly <laughs> but you do it because you love it and yeah these conversations are important they enrich you your life your personality your growth like and, and you know one caveat is that there is actually no better feeling than to make money doing music if you can if you can do that here and there the feeling That's that you fine. get from that yeah, yeah it's really <laughs> good. yeah it's really good yeah. you know but the only thing I would caution is never make making money your focus because that's yeah. what I did I was like that for all my life it's all I would think about and the people that ended up hating me and they kind of had a reason to, because I was, I could care less about anybody unless there was some kind of business deal to be made. And there's so many people like that. People who are success, successful in business are often jerks as people. Yeah. Not always, not yeah. always, but it, it, it can be a tendency. Even if we look at the public, you know, the Donald Trump idea, most people think that he's not like a great guy but he made a lot of money and there are a lot of followers there are a lot of people that follow them you'd think that most people wouldn't but he has a lot of dedicated followers that means half the world is wired to value money like that and so I'm not against making money I'm not against being rich I'm not against people who are rich what I'm against is people putting that as a priority over what's really important, which is talking to people, which is 
empathizing with them, sympathizing with them, being friends with them, you know, trying not to be selfish and trying not to take all experience to be about me. Mm-hmm. Like, how is it affecting me? Thinking of others and how they Exactly. Feel. I was very selfish in my old life. All I thought about was me. And on top of that, I, all I thought about was me and how much I could make. Do you still think about yourself a little bit now? or? I tend not to. You know, I have kids. Mm-hmm. I would say 100% is about them. Mm-hmm. That's all I care about. Like, literally. I can give up everything, every single thing, except that. I'm their dad. Mm-hmm. That's 100% all I care about. I, I really do. I don't care. Like, I'll do it, and I hope to live a life where a lot of people are, mm-hmm. are enriched somehow, including mm-hmm. myself. But at the end of the day... That's why I do everything now in my post-stroke mode. It's, you know, in my previous mode, it's like, oh, I got kids. That's one project. Oh, no. Like, that's... But I'm sure actually a lot, a lot of people, of people think people. like that, yeah. A lot of people. I can, mm-hmm. I can guarantee a lot of people think like that. Okay. And you should really stop me, too, but it would be really interesting just to... Um, well, thank you. Thank you. He has another meeting now. But thanks for watching and thanks for listening. This is my best life podcast with Flavia Badia.